Welcome to the Franchise Founders Podcast, where you'll hear right from the source how people like you have been able to buy and build their businesses across different industries all over the country. Dan Claps is the co-founder of Career Transition Leads, Nurture Assist, and Find a Business Online. Christian Dadalak is a franchise consultant with Find a Business Online, and he heads up business development for Career Transition Leads and Nurture Assist. He also runs an independent franchise consulting business, The Franchise Guys. Together, they formed relationships with hundreds of successful business owners who are excited to share their stories with you. Now, here are your hosts, Dan and Christian. Well, Georgia, thank you for joining our our Franchise Founders podcast. Uh, We've established a relationship, I want to say, what is it now, like eight months ago when we first met? Sure. Six or seven seven months, maybe. But um, yeah, wanted to just kind of talk about Mr. Duck Cleaner. Obviously, we work together in Nurture Assist as uh, lead generation for your company. Um, How did you get started with Mr. Duck Cleaner? So um, time flies when you're having fun. And uh, for us, it's been fun. Uh, Mr. Duck Cleaner has been franchising for about a year now. Um, we, so we, we're passing our emerging franchise stage and moving into the, okay, we really are a franchise and we mean it stage. <laughs> we're up to about 10 franchisees right now. And the goal is to add 20 more this year. Um, we started franchising last year in February. Um, I am a minority owner. My husband, Joe, is also a minority owner. And the majority owner is Les Clow, the founder. Um, we met Les uh, it, with another business that we were working with. And upon a half hour conversation with him about his business, his processes, uh, and the amount of time that he was taking a day, which was about four hours a day to run his business, and the amount of money he was bringing in at that time, which was $500,000 a year, uh, we said, yeah, I think this is franchisable. <laughs> so, um, Because you always have to look at whether or not uh, the, the business model will feed um, two mouths. Will it feed the mouth of the franchisor? Um, in, in our case, and then will it also feed the mouth of the franchisee? Um, so we, we set up and started the franchise, keeping in mind that it was our goal. Uh, we want to make a lot of millionaires. Um, we want, uh, my, my quote is that I want to sell people mansions. I don't want to sell them little subway townhouses. I want to sell them the capability to make themselves uh, millionaires. So we started that process um, last February, and um, we actually, uh, Les has a lot of knowledge, but none of it was written down. Um, a little bit of it was videoed. So um, I, I helped write the operations and training manual. I was the first owner of the first franchise. So in going through the process of starting the franchise, I felt the pain. I understood the steps of beginning a business. Um, I could write the operations and training manual and then help write the FDD. Um, my husband and I are not lawyers. So we wrote the FDD and then had a lawyer review it to make sure that we were good on our processes and good to go. And um, then I, uh, February was when I started I, the Mr. Duck Cleaner Arlington franchise. Some of you people know Arlington is the home of Jerry Jones Stadium, otherwise known as AT&T uh, Dallas Cowboys home. That yeah, was my, yeah. my franchise uh, area. And um, I sold that in September um, so that I could concentrate fully on Mr. Duck Cleaner franchise systems. I sold it for 250,000, so I proved that the concept could work. Um, Out of that, I was able to net about 175 to 180,000. So I um, were from through there and through learning how to do that business myself. I I now have gone over to the side of the founder side, which is how do I find franchisees? Um, so we went into how does my franchisee make money and find customers. Now the question is from a selling marketing stage, um, how do we find potential franchisees? We joined IFPG. It's the only broker group that we joined. Uh, we became elite members and it was great. Uh, it gets you in front of people. And that's where I met Dan and met Christian. And um, discussions went up as to um, the, the problem was, how do I get the brokers to pay attention to me? And they have so many other concepts and there's so many of us in the water. 
um, I took Dan's advice and, and made some changes on our um, on our portal and made some changes from a marketing standpoint, designed the website so that a lot of questions that somebody who wants to be a franchisee has, has uh, answers to. So I put those answers up on the website so that uh, I could always point somebody to it if I didn't have the time to talk to them about it. So we built out a really robust uh, franchising page on the website. And then the next question was, well, how do I get people besides the brokers to look at this page? Well, that was where Nurture Assist came in. Um, so the Nurture Assist leads, I started with them in November um, and I bought a hundred leads. Um, in terms of lead acquisition cost, it was a heck of a lot cheaper than a lot of other things that were out there. Uh, I didn't know anything other than I trusted Dan. Um, we had just met him. He has integrity. And we said, okay, let's, I mean, fine, let's spend the money. Uh, we budgeted for it, purchased the leads, got 100 leads in. Uh, all you get is the email address, the uh, phone number of the person, um, and the person's name. Um, and then you have to chase those leads. So out of the first 100 leads I got in, I popped them into a CRM system. I um, found out very quickly that emailing them, um, simply emailing them and not texting them, you're not gonna get them to read the emails. Nobody watches their emails anymore. Um, and if they do, it's suspicious enough. It looks like it's you know coming from somebody they don't know. They're not gonna open it. What I did find is that if I emailed them and then a couple minutes later texted them um, a quick text saying, hey, I, just, I understand you're interested in us. I'd like to talk to you for five minutes. Do you have some time? And sending them that text uh, caused them to read the email because I could see it on my CRM system, caused them to go to the website. And then um, I ended up having 35 conversations out of the 100 leads. So having 35 conversations is great. Um, I, I quickly figured out um, how to uh, shorten that conversation process. I, um, within, I, 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 with most, the majority of them, within talking to them in five minutes, I could figure out if I was going to disqualify them or move them on to the qualification stage. So that lead came into the top of my funnel. Um, and I have a, a process set up where I, I just ask them some basic questions. Um, they're kind of thrown off because they think what you're going to do is spout about Mr. Duck Cleaner. I don't. Um, I typically start out with uh, what territory are you interested in? Where do you live? What territory are you interested in? Is that, that you know, the same places where you live? And then the next question I ask them is, uh, what are your goals? And... Um, I can tell by how they answer that question, whether or not I'm gonna move them into qualification or disqualification. Um, it's pretty easy. So if, if they say something like, um, my goal is to make a lot of money fast and retire to an island in, in the Fijis, um, then uh, I, they're not good for me. They're not good for Mr. Duck Cleaner, okay? Because th they wanna make money fast, they don't wanna work at it. Um, then that's automatically, I'm going to say something to them basically that is something to the effect of, I don't think it's a fit with us. Thank you very much for reaching out. Um, um, you know, we're just not the franchise for you. And I will cut them off there. If they tell me that their goal is um, that they want to spend more time with their kids or they want to um, go to their kids' wrestling matches, or they want work-life balance, uh, they want their weekends back, um, or if they tell me that they want to, um, uh, one guy was telling me he was a manager at a warehouse, and he said, all I want is I, I spend 12 hours a day solving other people's problems in their emergencies. I want those problems to be mine. And I want to have the ability to make money off of when I solve those problems. So um, those are great responses. You move them over into qualification. I obviously am a good opener. I, I can talk to you guys like nothing. I stink at closing. Um, so we've split it up at Mr. Duck Cleaner. Um, I will open them, move them into qualification. 
if they fill out an application and we check them out and it looks like they're really a person and they're really intent and it looks like they may have the money to do this um, and that gets pushed to the CFO, which is Joe, my husband. Uh, so if Joe says, yeah, I think they qualify here, then the next step is for them to talk to Les Clow. He's the founder, he's the closer. Um, and then Les goes on and closes it. So I do the opening and I, I continue to do that and like to have a lot of fun with it. It's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. I mean, that's just a wealth of information. And I think I'm hoping that everyone that's listening realizes how critical it is to have a dialed in franchise development process, knowing yep. what you're good at and maybe what another person on your team is good at. And that way you can set up your process in a way that helps to push those candidates through the pipeline. Because I think so often with leads, it's very easy to think 100% of it is on the lead provider and, and you know, the leads, they need to be quality, obviously, but it really is a marriage between the lead provider and the, the franchisor and the person working the lead. So you have to have that process with the leads. If you have any one part of the equation, but you're missing the other, then it, then it doesn't really work. But it sounds like you've, you've really figured it out at Mr. Duck Cleaner and you guys are having some good success with it. Yeah, so we are, we, we've, we also have this, um, uh, the big blue bus theory. Um, what happens if I get hit by a big blue bus tomorrow? Um, and is there somebody else that can do what I can do? Um, and so because eventually, um, I'd like to think since I'm the queen of Mr. Duck Cleaner that I'm worth a lot of money an hour, okay? So eventually, I, I should not be the one that's talking to these people individually because my time is worth a little bit more money. So what I'm doing now is documenting this process of franchise development. So we have templates. Um, I have email templates of different templates I send to them based upon where that lead came from. I have a couple of different text templates. Um, and then I have a script that um, I, I kind of follow basic things that I want to ask them. Those questions are written down so that if I stepped out tomorrow, and yeah, I don't want to get hit by the big blue bus, but let's say that I win the lottery and decide that I want to go hang out and do around the world an 80 days trip, I'm gone. Somebody else from Mr. Duck Cleaner should be able to also do this process. Um, some of what we do is very automated, but I don't want the end user to see that it's automated so that my CRM system does mail merges. So it lists the person's first name and says, dear, dear Joshua, and then has puts that into the template. Uh, I can also change that template as I enter it in. I think the weakness that you have when you use a system where a file comes in, a CSV file comes in, and then populates in the CRM system and no human ever touches it, is um, uh, you, you lose some of those people who are fighting that system. Some of my leads come in as um, Mr. Likely Love, and then it has Jones as the last name, okay? So when I go to type it in, I just type in Mr. L and then Love. And then I'll tease them on the template about saying, are you really likely love or whatever? So I'm, I'm, I see the data and then I capitalize some things that are capitalized so that they understand there's a human touch in here. There has to be some point where you take a look at that data and put the human touch in it, knock out some of the chaff. There's, this is also what you guys, what Nurture Assist is very good at is if I get a lead in, and it has too many numbers on the phone number or the email comes back as a bounce back. I simply send you back that lead and say, hey, I want credit for this lead because it's not a good lead. And you, uh, Nurture Assist has credited me back for that lead. So I, I feel like there is a real working together to find the right system, to, to find what's going to work for Mr. Duck Cleaner. I know the other thing that really scares a lot of people is, um, are you taking the leads that Mr. Duck Cleaner gets and selling them to somebody else? Right. And um, I know that you're not. And the reason I know you're not is because I've seen the ad and the ad is specific to Mr. Duck Cleaner. And the answer is to Mr. Duck Cleaner. So it's not anything you can sell to anything else. Uh, I think you have to take ownership of your company and make sure that the marketing ads are, these are the bullet points of what makes my franchise different from others. These are the bullet points of what makes us um, tick. And then make sure that that advertising is that way. And the thing is that I know you're not selling it to anybody else because the advertising is specific to Mr. Duck Cleaner. 
And so I know that Nurture Assist takes the time to do that, but then you also have the time to tweak that algorithm, which I don't. Um, I don't want to spend the time figuring out where those people come from. I can tell you that I've gotten an, an array of different occupations. I, I had somebody who was working as a nuclear technician. I had somebody who's working on oil fields down in Houston. I have somebody who's a general contractor in California. I have somebody else who's uh, running a carpet cleaning business and wants to expand. So I, I get a, an array of different people from different organizations. I don't want to know how that algorithm works. I don't want to know how the sausage is made. I just want to know that um, some of these leads are going to work. You know, so it, it works great for me. Yeah. Yeah, it's well said. I mean, what we do um, to summarize, it's really interesting. So we, we met, you joined the IFPG, uh, started working with brokers, and then said, I want to additionally, as we attract broker candidates, mm -hmm. um, I want to I want to be proactive. I want to get can, uh, leads coming to us immediately. Right? So we signed up together with Nurture Assist. And you get the leads, you call, you email, you text them, right? Big thing is you text them. And then mm -hmm. you, you call them. Uh, and out of 30, out of 100 of your leads of your first batch, you were able to contact 35. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you've, you've moved forward to, you know, with those, those candidates, um, you know, our mission as a company, it's funny. I wrote down when I first got into the industry seven years ago, uh, a much less uh, sophisticated mission, but it was on a, my whiteboard and still in my room uh, to help as many people as I possibly can own a business. Right. And I always said, if you could do that, then if you make a lot of people uh, do well in business then you, and you make a little bit of money each time, then that adds up to, to real, real sure. wealth. Um, and I, since then, it's changed. My personal mission is to empower executives to make a positive life change through business ownership. And we do that in all of our, our companies. Um, but it's just, it's so exhilarating to know that here's a great concept. Mr. Duck Clean, a phenomenal franchise opportunity, semi-absentee business, and, you know, really can be a life changer for someone. Partnered with you right now and someday maybe another person, but you doing the right development process partnered mm -hmm. with Nurture Assist Leads, and that's how we've gotten that great synergy together. Right, right. I, I would say um, a third of our um, closing um, franchisees prospects that in the next couple of months came from Nurture. A third of them were organic and came from asking our own franchisees for referral, friends and family asking for that. And then one third of them come from an IFPG broker. Yeah. So. Um, you know, as we continue, we'll, we'll continue to look at that a little further. Um, but uh, the, it's, it, it's energy in, energy out. And I feel like Nurture is putting the energy in on their side and sending me the data. It's time for me to take my energy and play with it and then make the best that I can of it um, and, and have successful candidates come out. Absolutely. So, Georgia, what's some advice that you would give to new clients of Nurture Assist and how to work the leads properly. And, and we've heard a little bit about your development process, but what kind of expectations would you encourage them to have as well? Because I think sometimes people confuse a lead for a buyer or a, a super strong candidate, and that's not necessarily how it works. So what would you say to them? So I would say one of the biggest mistakes that I've seen um, franchisors make uh, in leads and, and chasing leads is you try to chase those leads on your time and not on their time. You try to get the potential. So it's like you're trying to sell them a house, okay? And, and so people like to go house hunting on the weekends because that's when they're off of work, all right? Here, we're selling a business. People like to go business hunting in the evenings or on the weekends. That's because that's when they have the time to take a look at it and they will respond to those ads then. So I, I, I'm not to say give up your Saturdays and Sundays, but I've got it set up so that if, as long as I have a little computer near me that I can play with and, and put the franchise, uh, put this into my CRM system, I chase those leads on Saturday when they come in. I chase them on Sunday when they come in. I talked to somebody on Sunday evening 
during the Chiefs game one time because I couldn't stand it and I didn't want to watch any more of the Chiefs game. It was just too tight. And so I chased a lead and that person, it was great because he was from Buffalo. And so we were discussing the Buffalo and the Chiefs and then we, we began to, to go. But people want you to talk to them on their time, not on yours. And so don't try to fit this in to an eight to five schedule and think you're going to be okay. I don't know if it means eventually hiring somebody who's $15 an hour or whatever on the weekends on Saturday and Sunday afternoons to chase those leads and come across and talk to them. But that's when most of the time they can talk. Don't, uh, does it mean that I have given up my work-life balance? Absolutely not. Um, when I was in Europe over um, the holidays, uh, I was able to easily chase these leads on Saturdays and Sundays because of the time difference, it was great. <laughs> and I was able to get it in it. And so um, it, it's a matter of, and people respect you if you respect their time. So for them, it's when those leads come in, chase them. And I'm not saying that you have to call them within five minutes of receiving the lead. I'm just saying that realize that you're gonna get the most traction on the weekends because that's when people are looking to make changes in their life. And they don't consider that during the week typically. You know, I think, I think what you're saying is so spot on because what I've learned in being in franchise development and lead generation is a company goes out, they spend a lot of money to become a franchise system typically, unless they do it on their own, but typically they're writing an FDD and ops manuals and they're paying all this money to become a franchise system. And I'm mostly referring to emerging brands. They pay a lot of money and they become a franchisor and then it's time to start marketing their franchise system and i sometimes feel like they're all everyone's got a great business right and it's special and they know why right sure but they feel like they could just hang a, a sign up on the you know on a shack you know put, put up the shackle and and whatever the saying is but you know hang a sign and people are just going to come because this is the greatest concept and everyone's got to know it we're the next orange right. theory dunkin donuts massage envy uh, but they forgot that the candidates, the leads, they don't know that at all. They don't know anything about their right. franchise. And so having that aggressive, uh, you know, or proactive approach of calling them, texting them, also giving them emails and marketing in case they're that kind of person that just wants to review first. But I think people forget that that's what we need to do to get in front of, you know, uh, candidates in any business. Um, and, you know, with, with nurtures, that's what we're doing really is we are targeting buyer personas. We've identified what your buyer persona is, who you want as a franchisee, ideally. We're advertising to that audience through social media. That's our secret sauce being on dial in to sure. exact demographics that you want. And then we're serving them ads on social media, just like we used to with TV and newspaper, except the audience eyeballs are on social media. And by the way, there's a misconception that wealthy people are not on Facebook. And I always question first, all of us here, I think we could all buy a franchise. Are you on Facebook? The answer is yes, right? I'm on Instagram and Facebook all the time. <laughs> uh, there's, I think, 2 billion people on social media, Facebook and Instagram. I forget the exact mm -hmm. number. And we heard they the are. candidates George has been meeting with too. Right. You yeah. know, it's, and, and they're different age groups. So I think also... I, I subscribe to all of these franchise insights and franchise data, anything free that I can get, I'm going to get it. And so the latest one comes in today and says uh, Facebook is uh, in trouble and, and uh, that the, the, the cost acquisition is going up on Facebook and some other things um, because you, you can't, uh, you're, you, you can't, especially with the Apple users and the I, iOS 14, that, um, you know, people can stop the tracking. Well, that's just a little bit of the tracking. Okay, they can still give you income, uh, household income. They can give you, uh, you, you can do areas. Um, you can set it up. You can still do age. They know all those things. So whether or not they happen to go to the hunting website or whether or not they happen to go to the luxury goods website, it's not as important. And I, because I, I know I used to do marketing. So uh, I used to own a marketing company. So I know that that's there. But still, Facebook is still the best place, even if the algorithms have had to evolve. It's still the best place to grab this, this information. I, we tried 
we tried LinkedIn as a franchise uh, concept. We tried LinkedIn. The acquisition costs were way too high on LinkedIn to push through. And the people that you're getting on LinkedIn are not necessarily the people who are going to be wanting to purchase a business. They're just looking to sell you something or you sell them something. Um, so LinkedIn was not as good of a place. Uh, we tried old school. We tried. Uh, so uh, my husband and I have been on this planet for a long time, and he talked about how th the best thing to do was to have a happy hour in the location that you wanted to locate in, have a happy hour, invite your potential prospects and have them come to the happy hour. Well, COVID has made that a little bit harder, and we went and tried it anyway in an area. The only person who showed up was the IFPG consultant. <laughs> so it was like, okay, so where are people and the thing is people are not going out to these happy hours and they're not going out they're still staying on social media yeah so yeah. it's it's just has it become a little bit harder you bet okay does that mean that other people are not going to do it yay they're not going to do facebook anymore more for me less for you i'll take more of the pie you know it's interesting. I, Christian and I were both on the Home Summit, uh, Home Services Summit last week, and they used this incredible uh, technology to run the conference. I was very impressed by it. And one of the things they had was in their breakout sessions, uh, you were in these virtual rooms, right? But versus a computer screen like this where you're doing Zoom, everyone was on, like their face was on a little couch around a table. And I can't explain to you how you have to try it. You feel more like you're talking to those people in a room than you do with Zoom. And it's really interesting to think about how the technology, how fast I can see us. I hate to say it, you know, but I do see it. We could be in a metaverse in you know, yeah. a couple of years having these same conversations. Um, you know, so yeah, we have to adapt to that. And I'll just share with you, uh, I read that same uh, Franchise Insights post yeah. today, which I think they're incredible with their content. But, you know, you work with a firm like Nurture Assist because we're, we're ahead of that. You know, I had read in the, we were already thinking about it, but I had read in the Wall Street Journal on, I think, Saturday that there was this massive shift is really starting to take precedence with the Apple and Facebook battle and the privacy. And, you know, what we did just to be proactive, and we, we made this change on Tuesday. So uh, we've already made this, this shift. We took from our other company, Career Transition Lead, it's very granular, I'm going to tell you, but I, I want to share it. Uh, we've been in business since 2016, mm -hmm. targeting executives that are in a transition. We've paid over a million dollars over the years to uh, assimilate all that data that we've put into our, our system. And we have a call center that's called on that data and we've vetted it, right? And so what we did was we said, we've got this valuable data of people that we know are executives that are in a transition that have said that they have the liquidity available right? And we took that proprietary data and we plugged that in to social media and we've created what's called a lookalike audience, which is essentially okay. Facebook smarter than any, than me. They figured out how to say this data, we have similar people based on the name, the email, the phone, uh, the uh, email address, the city and the zip code. Here's similar, similar people to clarify. It doesn't target the people we have already done. That's not an issue. We're not going to recreate, uh, right. but we've created this this um, lookalike audience. So now we're not reliant on Apple changing their privacy standards. Right. And that's how we're going to continue to adapt. It, it, it's um, the, the thing is that the social media algorithms, they learn. Um, and so you throw something at them, you throw a roadblock at them, they'll learn a, another way to find you the better prospects. And it's, it, it, it's, you see it on LinkedIn when LinkedIn will watch your search. And uh, I'm teaching this to the franchisees next week that LinkedIn will watch your search and then start throwing up people that you should know based upon what, what you've searched for. And then they'll go, well, how about this candidate? How about that candidate? So all of the social media companies have their little tips and tricks. And because Apple threw up this roadblock, I don't think it's going to stop Facebook. Um, so it, it's a, a question of what do I have to go back to? If I don't do this, what, how am I going to get leads? I can't put a sign, like you said, I can't put a little sign outside of my apartment here in Dallas and say, Mr. Duck Cleaner franchises for sale and expect people to see that. Okay. And especially if I only have the slot sign lit from nine to five, 
Okay, <laughs> so it's when do these leads, bring in the leads in, digital leads is the where, where it comes at, who you work with, just choose who your the firm is that you work with. Make sure they have some integrity. Make sure they have something behind them, and they're not selling your leads to somebody else. And um, you know, start the relationship. Nurture Assist is great to start the relationship with. Your only other alternative is to try and do it yourself. And you got to have a lot of chops and a lot of of you got to have a lot of data, a lot of chops to do your lookalike audiences and to get the kind of leads that you're going to get. It's cheaper for me just to buy the leads from Nurture Assist. Yeah, it's funny. I just posted something on Facebook and LinkedIn the other day. I think it was yesterday, actually, about how sometimes it's very easy for us as people to be a penny wise, but a dollar foolish and step right. over dollars to get to dimes. And so, yeah, absolutely. People can do the Facebook ads. Franchisors can do those Facebook ads themselves. But I think one of the benefits of working with a firm like Nurture Assist is the fact that you have your company that's we're, we're partnering with with the franchisors that we work with so that we can be the Facebook expert, we can navigate that changing landscape so that they don't have to. Right. They can focus on what they do best, which is talking about their brand, getting excited about their brand and qualifying people that ultimately are the right fit to be a franchisee in their system. And so it's, I, I think that that's absolutely well said, Georgia. Well, and a lot of times the act of organizing what the ad should say will help you tweak your marketing and make you a better company because if you can't say in you know five bullet points or uh, three sentences what makes your franchise different from others then you need to re-examine yourself and re-examine your marketing so it's a way to it's a it, it in doing it and making the commitment you organize you need to organize your thoughts organize your messages organize your targets you know, it, it, and and do that, follow up on it, and then change that every once in a while because the message changes. So our, you know, we're on a mission, as I said, to help executives make a positive life change through business ownership. We do it through all of our, our, our services and companies. Um, we do this lead generation knowing that under a hundred units in franchising, there's a statistic out because of the way that lead generation costs have increased that the franchisor on average with under a hundred units will spend anywhere from 15 to $25,000 to acquire a franchisee. Now, if I'm a franchisor, I sit back in my chair and that makes me fall off of it. It sounds like a lot of money, but you have to realize that the lifetime value that you're going to create through one Obviously, you get a franchise fee. That is not why you're in business. But with Nurture Assist, you are not paying a broker and an FSO if the candidate purchases three territories. That you know, less your lead cost is your you know is your um, is your franchise fee, right? Um, but obviously, you've got lifetime value of a franchisee over ten years in royalty. So that twenty five thousand uh, definitely, if it's on the high note, twenty five thousand will be an investment that pays for itself. Uh, tenfold. But right. we're, we're trying to do is keep that cost down because we understand franchisors don't have fifteen to $25,000 every franchisee. And so are there any stats you can share with us on you, what you've been seeing with Nurture Assist as far as? So um, the whole thing is uh, um, if, it, if, I, um, if I buy a lead, if I get a lead in, a franchisee in from a broker, I have to pay a broker fee. Those broker fees right now on IFPG, our broker fee is $25,000, okay? If I take a Nurture Assist lead, uh, I've been paying for, um, you know, underneath $4,000 for 100 leads, okay? If I convert on one of those, then I spent $4,000 for that lead and I saved $21,000, yeah. okay? So I think... It kind of makes sense to try it myself um, and try and use try it myself with a little help from nurture. Um, not to say that I'm going to be better than the brokers, but right now, if I can't get people to pay attention to me, then I got to do it myself. If I got to do it myself, I'm going to get some help and I'm going to go, go get a tool. Well, go get a tool is nurture assist right? The tool is nurture assist. And then all that happens is these leads start coming in and I got to do something with them. And the thing is, I respect it because I paid for the leads. 
So I've got to follow them. It's sort of like paying for a weight loss thing. You know, you, you, you're you going to pay for the, the gym in advance so that you lose weight, right? Same thing here is I'm going to pay for these leads. I better chase them. And if I convert, then I can prove to everybody else um, that, yes, Nurture Assist is the way to do it. And you're not paying for clicks. You're paying for leads. No, you're not paying for clicks at all. And I don't have to worry about the clicks and the, the chaff on that. And like I said, if I do get one in that is not a good lead, I get credit for it. So I'm only paying for good leads. Now, can I get the person on the other end to open the email to answer the text? No, sometimes I can't. You know, out of 100, I got 35 conversations. I probably got 50 to open the email um, through the text, maybe 75. I got a good response because I have really good text. I know what I, what it is I'm saying. And I, I'm basically, it's three sentences or less. If you've got to spout out um, and the text goes on to two pages, they're not going to read it. You know, it's got to be a, I respect your time. I want to talk to you. And I want to tell you about this really good deal. You know, and then in the email, it's, I respect your time. I want to talk to you. And in the meantime, if you want to check us out, here are the links to go to to check us out so that they can buy at their own pace. But I, I think from a economic standpoint, the more I can chase these leads and make them mine, the better off I am mm -hmm. than, than paying for them. And I'm not saying that you're going to replace a broker. I, 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 it's almost like saying it's so ideal because I get to sell my house using a real estate broker. I also get to sell my house for sale by owner right. with those yeah. leads coming in um, with, with somebody sending me in potential owners. Right. Well said. Yeah. And as a franchise consultant myself, I don't want to poo poo working with brokers, but sure. we've all heard the old adage that you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, diversify, don't have all of your leads coming from any one source. So work with the brokers, keep working with IFPG, but also have, you know, have your, your other leads that are coming in from other sources too. And that way you have a well-rounded approach for how to yeah. develop new franchisees. So I think that's all wonderful. I think you're, you're right. kicking butt. I agree. We are, we're happy. Yeah. And Nurture Assist is a great partner. <laughs> Love to hear that. We really do. So I guess, I think we have time for maybe one or more, one or two more questions. Um, I, my question is, what's the vision for Mr. Duckling? Where do you guys want to be? And, you know, um, so our vision is to build it to at least um, 100 franchises within probably three and a half to four years. So I'm a, I'm a fan of Jordan Peterson. And Jordan Peterson says um, that uh, if you set your goals too high, you're going to be disappointed. So I would rather set my goals as easily attainable and then go, okay, we made that and go on. So I'm the person who, when I go grocery shopping or when I have a list of to-do, when I do my to-do list for the day, I always put something on there that I can cross off right away, like make the bed. Okay, so I put make the bed on my to-do list because I get joy out of crossing that off my list. So when I set the goals, I try and set goals that are realistic and, are, and um, that are going to put me at the pace. We've, we've changed from trying to say, um, I'm going to, my goal is to grow fast. Um, it's not, that's not the goal. The goal is to grow smart and to grow good franchisees. And if I put a time limit on that, then I'm, I'm not able to pivot when things come in or whatever. So I can tell you from, if, if I look out three years, what, is, what does it look like? Uh, three years, I think we'd like to have uh, probably 90 or 100 franchisees. Um, but so, but yesterday we just had somebody convince us to sell them a different type of territory. So we're now going to open a micro Mr. Duck Cleaner um, for a territory. So our territories are designed to, to um, they're big territories. They're designed to have three uh, fran vans in a territory. But um, we have somebody who we're going to sell a territory to them that's a little smaller, and they've convinced us that they have the chops to make it work. And we're going to change our, uh, our revenue expectations on that all the time, them realizing um, that it is a micro territory. So um, we've changed that. We've pivoted because there were people there that were going to be able to make it work. Not because any broker 
place told us to do this or whatever. If we have, if you have the opportunity and you've got somebody in, and your model isn't quite fitting, then you need to examine your model. And okay, so we'll let somebody try a micro territory. If they fail, then we won't do it again. Um, but if they do succeed, then maybe we should look at our territory models again and look at selling two types of territory at different prices. So um, I, I would say that in setting your goals, don't be afraid to break the goal. Don't be afraid to take it off your list or change it. You know, just because you've set this goal and in your head you've said this is where I'm going to be, two years from now things may have changed. You know, we may be at war. Um, that and, and given the, the events in the last couple of days, you know, those things may change. Allowing those goals to change is fine. Uh, it don't set yourself in stone. I know it's nice to have the saying up on the wall or have this vision, and it's great to, to realize what the vision is going to be, but at the same time, if you need to change it, change it. I agree completely. I think it's so critical to have those, those quick wins and to build that momentum. I agree 100%. I like Jordan Peterson too. I make my bet every day. First thing I do, because you have to get that quick win. I also right. wrote a book called Make My Bet. It was from yes. an admiral, former Navy SEAL. I love it. Ever, ever since That's I read that book. Made it before you did. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so I always do that because it's my first win of the day every sure. day. And I, I like the idea of putting it on my checklist so I can cross it off. Oh, totally. Feel the win. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But you build momentum. And I think that it's good to have an overarching vision, but to have the, the immediate goals within sight and that are attainable because ultimately those immediate goals will help you to build up to that, that ultimate vision that you have. And like you said, it's good to be able to pivot and be flexible and, you know, have, have the goal, but be flexible in your approach and the methodology. And mm -hmm. I think it's just so interesting to hear what Mr. Duck Cleaner is doing along the way to, uh, to franchise success. And, you know, you're already having success, but to have continued success and to really blow up, it's, it's really fun to watch. The only other piece of advice I have is just because everybody else is doing it doesn't mean that's right. Okay, so because I'll be like, well, other people they use they don't do this and they don't do that. Well, okay, but for us, it's working. If it works for your group, just because it's not the way it's done doesn't mean it's not a good way. Yeah, you know, especially for you. So I, I I've learned. Um, I've been in franchising for a long time. I have background with franchising and I've been a, an IFA speaker regionally. Um, but, and I can tell you that there's certain things, well, you know, this is how much you need to pay for this and this is how much you need to do and this is how you need to go. If you can figure out a better way, faster way or more complete way to find somebody, do it. Just because it's not done, that's not the way it's done in the franchising world. I love it when I hear that from somebody, especially when they're in one of these big franchise groups and they'll be like, well, that's not how it's done. It is how it's done for Mr. Duck Cleaner. <laughs> Right. As long as it's getting done, yeah. you know, it's, as long as it's getting done. And that's why try different alternatives, but always know your message. Um, definitely know your message and have all your franchisees know your, have to know your message. Very good. Uh, great advice. Thank you for, for joining us. I love bending your guys' ears. <laughs> <laughs>